Thank you. Now, before we move to the first item of business today, uh, colleagues will be aware that this Friday, the 8th of May, marks the 75th anniversary of VE Day, Victory in Europe, which saw the end of fighting in Europe in the Second World War. Most colleagues would normally be attending services or commemorations in person on Friday. But in the absence of that, in the face of restrictions, I wonder if colleagues would join me in observing one minute silence to remember all of those who suffered, who fought and died in that horrific conflict. Now, we're going to begin with First Minister's questions, but before we do, I wonder if I might ask the First Minister to introduce our comments with a, first, a brief statement. First Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, for the opportunity to give a very brief update on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 12,709 positive cases confirmed, an increase of 272 since yesterday. A total of 1,632 patients are currently in hospital with confirmed or suspected cases of COVID-19. That is a decrease of 24 from yesterday. A total of 89 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected cases of the virus. That is a decrease of 15 on yesterday. And in the last 24 hours, 83 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed as having COVID-19 which takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 1,703. The figures I've provided are the most accurate figures we can provide on a daily basis. They record all registered deaths where the individual had been tested and confirmed as having the virus. However, each Wednesday, National Records of Scotland produce a more detailed weekly report that includes not just those with a confirmed diagnosis, but also cases where COVID-19 is entered on a death certificate as a suspected or contributory cause of death. The latest NRS report has just been published. It covers the period up to Sunday, the 3rd of May. At that point, if I can remind members, according to our daily figures, 1,576 deaths had been registered of people who had tested positive. However, today's report shows that by Sunday, the total number of registered deaths linked to the virus confirmed and presumed was 2,795. 523 of those deaths were registered in the seven days up to Sunday. That is a decrease of 135 from the week before. In fact, I think it is important to note this is the first weekly reduction in COVID-19 deaths we've seen since the first death related to the virus was registered. 49% of all registered COVID-19 deaths occurred in hospital, 43% in care homes and 8% at home or in other settings. In the most recent week, however, 59% of all deaths linked to the virus happened in care homes. Uh, while that is a deeply distressing figure, it is nevertheless important to note that the number of deaths in care homes also reduced last week compared to the week before. Uh, and finally, the total number of deaths, while still significantly higher than the five-year average, also fell, which means that what we refer to as excess deaths were lower last week than in the week before. 83% of excess deaths had COVID-19 as the underlying cause. Now, hearing reports of any number of deaths is difficult, uh, and my thoughts, as they always are, are with all of those who have been bereaved. And I am acutely aware that trends in statistics in no way eases the pain of losing a loved one. But in the broader fight against this virus, 
this week's figures do give us some hope. Uh, the number of deaths has reduced overall, as have excess deaths and the deaths related to the virus, both in general and in care homes. Uh, now, tomorrow, the Scottish Government must formally consider whether to continue the current restrictions for another three weeks. As I have indicated, our progress, while real, is still too fragile to immediately ease restrictions in any significant way. But we are planning now for ways in which we can gradually do so as soon as possible, and more detail on that is set out in the paper published yesterday. However, Presiding Officer, for the moment, uh, the message remains clear. Please stay at home except for essential purposes. Stay more than two metres from other people when you are out. Don't meet up with people from other households. Wear a face covering if you are in a shop or in public transport, and isolate completely if you or someone else in your household has symptoms. If we all stick with it for a bit longer, we will, I am sure, see more progress and we will bring forward the moment when some of these restrictions can start to be eased. Thank you. Thank you very much, First Minister. We turn to our first question, Jackson Carver. Uh, presiding officer, uh, we've all learned in recent work weeks about the R number, the reproduction rate of the coronavirus. And this week, the Scottish Government suggested that to start ending lockdown, the R number would have to be less than one for a sustained period. And it's said that a different approach for different areas, either within Scotland or the rest of the UK, could be justified by, and I quote, a meaningfully different R number. First Minister, could that difference be with the rest of the UK figure or regionally, say, the north of England? Does it refer to a statistical difference or is it more of a judgment by ministers? So can I ask the First Minister to confirm, what exactly does a meaningfully different R number look like? First Minister. Um, this is not the most helpful way of starting to answer this question, I appreciate, but it, it could be a mix of all of those things. Uh, what we published yesterday was our best assessment of where the R number is right now, between 0.7 and 1. Uh, we also said that there is an indication that it may right now be slightly higher in Scotland than in other parts of the UK, though there's a, a significant degree of uncertainty in that. Uh, if that was the case, there would be some common sense uh, attached to that. Our first confirmed cases were later, so we may be slightly behind the curve, uh, and that may only be by a matter of days. Uh, the, the data uh, that is used uh, to make those assessments comes from the kind of statistics that I have just reported. And uh, what the experts tell me is that there are no uh, particular set numbers that we need to get to, but we need to have more confidence than we do right now that it is significantly below one, so that as we start to ease restrictions, it doesn't very, very quickly go uh, above one. Now, what I said yesterday is we have to be driven by the evidence, and that is entirely uh, what I will stick to throughout this. Of course, I have to apply judgment to that evidence and uh, if that evidence tells us that it is too soon to raise it to, to lift any of these restrictions now then we must uh, follow that and if there are differing experiences either in different parts of the UK or even in different parts of Scotland we have to pay attention to that and I think there's one of two things for us we, we all want and I certainly want as much consistency as possible not least because it makes the messaging uh, a lot simpler uh, but we either accept that there may be different paces dictated by the different stage of the infection, or we accept, within Scotland and within the UK, that uh, to, to uh, I suppose, simplify this, we all go at the pace of the, the slowest, if you like. Because what we can't have, and I, I hope everybody would agree with this, is no part of the UK or, or no area uh, forced into a position where they're lifting restrictions before the evidence says that it is safe to do so. Uh, so the evidence and being guided by that and applying best judgment to that is what I will continue to seek to do. Jackson Carlow. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that? And, and I'll come back to clarity of messaging, but I actually do have a considerable degree of sympathy of the point that she concluded on there. Uh, yesterday's Scottish Government paper was clear that getting the R number down was the priority. And that relies, as we go forward, on testing and tracing. However, testing numbers are still falling short of last week's target. So we're understandably at least a little bit sceptical about the government's promise to recruit 2,000 contact tracers in the next four weeks. Can the First Minister tell us how many contact tracers there are currently, how the 2,000 will be recruited and trained, and will she give this parliament a cast-iron guarantee that this target will be met? First Minister. Well, can I just 
perhaps pick up on a, a couple of things Jackson Carlaw said there, just for uh, the, the purposes of being very clear. Getting the R number down doesn't depend on testing and contact tracing. Getting the R number down depends on all of us behaving in a way that is suppressing the virus. That means everybody sticking to the rules and the guidance that we are asking them to. Keeping the R number suppressed, uh, keeping the virus suppressed and the R number down uh, will partly depend on continued social distancing, uh, but will partly depend on our ability to quickly identify outbreaks, and that is where testing and contact tracing comes in. Now, in terms of uh, testing, we had uh, we reported on the capacity uh, last week. We also reported that over the weekend and up until yesterday, uh, the Glasgow University capacity would be slightly lower than it is going to be because of a, a, a change to the shift pattern. Uh, there was uh, over 4,600 tests in total carried out uh, in Scotland yesterday, and that will continue uh, to increase as the capacity gets back to normal and as the capacity then increases beyond that. Now, in terms of how many contact tracers there are right now, uh, health boards, uh, contact tracer is not currently um, a discrete professional categorisation. Uh, there are, will be many different people working within health protection teams who, when re required, uh, fulfil that function. We have to scale up that capacity because of the scale of uh, this current infection that we're using it for, and therefore that 2,000 additional to what health boards, and right now health boards are looking um, at uh, where they can uh, use existing uh, staff to, to do this job, but uh, we will then, uh, from that, uh, be able to say with more certainty how many additionally we will require to recruit. But 2,000 is our best estimate right now of the additional uh, requirement that we uh, will need and then obviously we have to continue to increase the testing capacity uh, to be able to do the number of tests. Now the number of tests that you will require to do depends on the prevalence of the virus in the community. The assessments we are making right now is that that would require probably at a minimum uh, a capacity for around 15 and a half thousand tests per day but clearly these estimates will never be fixed in stone because they will depend on what, how the virus is operating uh, and we will keep Parliament updated as that progresses. This is work that both myself and the Health Secretary are scrutinising very closely as we go through this month because as I said the other day we intend to have the capacity for an enhanced uh, contact tracing operation to be in place by the end of May. Jackson Carla. I do appreciate the complexities involved in all of this but both on the R number and on the contact tracer target, the point is that from the public's perception of progress being made, as much clarity as possible is essential. Because as the First Minister told the BBC just this morning, balancing risks is difficult. The public have to be clear on what is happening and why. The key stay at home message has been effective because it has been delivered simply and with absolute consistency. It hasn't mattered if you're watching STV or the UK wide 10 o'clock BBC News, whether you read the Scottish Sun or the Guardian, you've received the same advice and the same message. Simplicity saves lives. So does the First Minister agree with me that to ensure its maximum effectiveness, future guidance should be equally simple and consistent across the UK within a framework of an agreed plan by all administrations. First Minister. Um, in broad terms, yes, I, I do agree with that. As, as one of the people that has to deliver this message on a daily basis, you don't, nobody needs to convince me about the importance of clarity and simplicity and being able to deliver that message and have the public respond in as magnificent a way as they have has been uh, incredibly helpful. I want as much consistency of messaging as possible and have worked very hard uh, to try to achieve that. I, We'll always say, and, and we'll say this openly as well as in, in private discussions, that a four nations approach uh, has to be, to, to be meaningful, has to be one that all four nations uh, have been involved in formulating and one that takes account of the evidence in each part of the UK, not just uh, the evidence in, in some parts of, of the UK. So that's the way we have to uh, continue to proceed and progress. And I'll, I'll end this answer with a point I've made before. If we are to have... You, we can have a four nations approach that is coordinated that accepts there will be some differences of pace depending on evidence. That would be perfectly legitimate. Or we can decide that doing the same thing at the same time is what matters most. Either of those is legitimate. If it is the latter, then this point I've made before is really important. We must go at the pace of the, the part of the UK that is furthest behind in the infection curve because to, not to do that would lead to parts of the UK potentially lifting restrictions before it was safe to do so. And that is, is the worry I would have uh, and what I'm not prepared to countenance here. Jackson Carver. Can, can I thank the First Minister? I, I agree with that. Uh, I, if we're going to have a four-nation approach, 
we either have to agree within the overall plan that is agreed that there will be differences in different parts of the United Kingdom or that we go at the pace of the slowest. What I think is important is that within an overall agreed plan, there is a clear messaging because the point is that mixed messages will not help and our priority here is in saving lives. And I think the First Minister might underestimate the potential for muddle that comes from mixed messaging. Now, construction firms, for example, are asking why firms in England, Wales and Northern Ireland have been able to work safely, but not here. If a building site in Carlisle can keep going, but operating safely, still in lockdown, without spreading the virus, why can't one in Dumfries? And the Scottish Government risks that kind of confusion on a bigger scale if there isn't a consistent message about how different types of workplace should operate across the UK. Again, simplicity saves lives. I mean, this isn't about politics, First Minister. It's about keeping things clear, and it's a genuine question. I'm sure, but why not just work to achieve the same guidance across the whole UK on how to work safely? If any given business can work safely anywhere and can do it without spreading the virus, then why not in Scotland? First Minister. Can I say, first of all, I, I think some people, I'm not saying anybody in particular, but some people seem to have a lot more angst about this UK-wide approach than I do. I have been very clear. I, I, if, if somebody says to me it has to be UK-wide at all costs, I'll say that's the wrong starting point. If somebody else says to me it has to be separate in Scotland at all costs, I'll tell them that's the wrong starting point. My starting point is what does the evidence tell us is the right thing to do to suppress the virus and save lives. That's the only thing I am interested in in what I'm dealing with right now. Now, you know, I, I could pitch... I, I, I take on uh, good faith that this is not about politics because it is certainly not about me. But when we have differences right now, I, I could say, well, maybe the, the problem is others are not following Scotland's guidance, just as others might say it's Scotland not following guidance elsewhere. There is a big assumption in Jackson Carlaw's question, uh, which is that it is safe for construction to be operating uh, normally in other parts of the UK. That is something, as First Minister of Scotland, I am not yet absolutely satisfied about. And I suppose my, my central proposition here is at the start of this outbreak, uh, if our judgment, and my judgment was that construction apart from for essential projects was not safe to operate, what has changed between now and then? Has enough changed for me to change that judgment? And my answer to that is not yet because uh, we are at such a critical stage, the evidence I am looking at tells me it would not take very much at all to send our progress into reverse. So we need to persevere for a little bit longer to get that progress more uh, solidified and be more confident about it. Now, we are working uh, with the Construction uh, Leadership Forum that's been established. They are working on a, a phased restart, which we are talking to them about. And I think there is a lot of common sense in that. But until I get to a point where... Uh, I am satisfied that saying whether it's to construction or anybody else, you can ease up a bit without risking this virus going into control. Then I think the responsible thing to do is to say, look, let's stick with the guidance we've got until we get to a position where we are more confident. And that's the, uh, the, the risk-based and uh, careful judgment that I have a responsibility to apply. And that's what I'm going to continue to do. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, uh, we welcomed the government's plans to reintroduce a test, trace and isolate strategy. Although we now have to build up capacity after this approach was abandoned by the government in March. The First Minister has confirmed today that a test, trace and isolate strategy cannot be implemented until the end of this month. But we know from international advice and experience that such an approach can carry on simultaneously with a lockdown and can have benefits throughout the course of a pandemic. Benefits like knowing what the R number is. Last week, the First Minister dismissed Professor Hugh Pennington's view that the R number in Scotland's care homes could be as much as 10. But we haven't been told what the number is if it is not 10. So can the First Minister tell us today or does she still not have sufficient evidence to be certain because of the government's failure to carry out a comprehensive testing programme. First Minister. Uh, well, th there's just a number of things in that that I do need to clarify. It is not, you don't need testing to tell you what the R number is. The R number comes from 
um, modelling re uh, based on a, a range of different data. Um, in terms of the R number, we, we do have an assessment that allows us to uh, say that it is between a certain range in the community. We don't yet have the ability to say that confidently in care homes. Uh, we think it is above one, as I, I don't dismiss anybody's view, but there is nothing I have seen um, and certainly nothing I have been told that would uh, suggest that it is as high, anywhere near as high as 10 in care homes. The difficulty of making that assessment across care homes generally is that there are half of care homes right now that don't have any infections in them. So it's not a standard uh, figure across all care homes. It will be variable in, in different uh, settings. Now, there is work ongoing to understand that in more detail, just as there is work ongoing to understand that uh, in other institutional settings, like hospitals, for example. So, you know, I am not uh, avoiding giving a figure, but these are, 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 are difficult things to arrive at. And people who have... Uh, are, more qualified than me to do these things are working hard to understand this as much as possible. Uh, in terms of uh, test, trace and isolate, um, what I, I didn't say, and just to be clear, that we can't do anything until the end of May. We are building up capacity so that we have an enhanced capability by the end of May. But there is testing and tracing happening uh, right now in, in Scotland. In, in Sky, for example, with the outbreak in the care home there, there has been a, a test and, and contact trace approach. Uh, this is about building up capacity. Nobody has ever uh, taken away capacity in Scotland from the start of this outbreak. We've been building up testing capacity. What we need to do is get it to uh, a level, and this will, as I say, will not be a fixed level, where it can operate uh, comprehensively uh, to keep the virus uh, suppressed and to be able to, to flex depending on uh, how the virus is operating. And that is the work that is underway right now. Richard Leonard. Thank you. I'm, well, I'm concerned about care homes because in the First Minister's statement, she confirmed that 59% of all deaths uh, this last week uh, were in residential care homes for the elderly. So it has uh, real uh, life and death consequences. And for weeks, families across Scotland have been unable to visit their loved ones in care homes in the hope that this would keep them safe. And we know that for many, it has sadly not been enough. In just the last week, the COVID-19 outbreak at the home farm care home on the Isle of Skye has tragically demonstrated how rapidly and widely this virus can spread in care homes. It has also brought home the importance of testing all care home residents and all care home staff, not just those who are symptomatic. First Minister, there are around 85,000 residents and workers in care homes for older people in Scotland today. So if we now have the capacity for 10,500 tests a day, uh, which you say are available, but with almost two thirds of that daily testing capacity currently going unused, then there is no reason why everyone in Scotland's care homes, both staff and residents, couldn't all be tested over the next two weeks. Given care homes are a priority, Will the First Minister finally give a commitment to making this happen? First Minister. Uh, I'll come on to exactly uh, the, the position in terms of testing in care homes, which is an important point. Can I say, firstly, uh, I am deeply concerned about the situation in care homes. There is not uh, a day, there's probably not an hour uh, goes by when I, the Health Secretary and others, uh, do not discuss the action that is being taken and the support we are giving uh, to deal with the situation in, in care homes. I, I uh, absolutely understand uh, how deeply distressing this is, particularly for relatives of people in care homes, for those who work in care homes, and, and for the wider public. And the figures today, as I said in my statement, are deeply distressing. And it doesn't uh, underplay or minimise the impact on individuals, though, when I say uh, these figures also say that for the first time uh, since uh, the situation in care homes occurred at the scale it has, we have seen in these figures a reduction in the number of deaths and what we are working hard to do is make sure that that reduction uh, continues in, in the weeks ahead. Uh, testing is important, and so we, uh, but it has to be clinically driven as well. Uh, in, in terms of uh, care homes where there is an outbreak, uh, there is now testing of uh, all residents, all staff, whether symptomatic or uh, asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic uh, and there is also uh, testing uh, being done in care homes without outbreaks uh, which will also include asymptomatic staff and residents. It's really important particularly uh, for frail elderly people where 
you know, the test can be unpleasant and invasive, but it is driven uh, by the best clinical advice and evidence, and that is what is happening. But the wider point I want to make is that while testing is important, uh, an important part of that, we must not, even inadvertently, oversimplify the situation to say that testing is the only thing that matters. Basic infection prevention and control is the most important thing in, in care homes and in, in dealing with a situation for this infection or uh, with any infection. That's why we've got directors of public health providing the enhanced clinical leadership that they are doing. They have contacted every care home in Scotland. They are assessing care home by care home how infection prevention and control has been managed, tra uh, staffing, training, uh, physical distancing and testing where there are deficiencies being identified. They are working to rectify those. We have the Care Home Rapid Action Group that is taking uh, accelerated action where that is necessary, uh, working with care home providers. So there is a whole uh, range of interventions that are essential in care homes if we are to make sure that uh, this outbreak is controlled uh, and that we continue to see the numbers of people affected and in particular the numbers of people losing their lives uh, declining. Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Our care workers are putting themselves at risk in the front line of this battle against COVID-19 every day and every night of the week, but many of them are among Scotland's lowest paid workers. Last week, the First Minister said, we will be looking for quite some time to come at how to properly recognise and reward those on the front line of our health and care services. But there is action that can be taken now Last week, the First Minister told me that the Health Secretary was developing a death-in-service payment. But when it was announced, it applied only to NHS staff and, disappointingly, not to care workers. This is something the First Minister could put right. This is something the First Minister should put right. And the Scottish TUC has called for all key workers, including care workers, to receive a pay rise of £2 an hour. Will the First Minister support this call from the STUC? And will she provide the funding for it? And will she see this as an important first step in ending the long-term undervaluation of our care workers? First um, on death and service, which is an important point, we do want to see these issues uh, properly addressed uh, for staff in uh, the, the social care sector. The reason why the announcement by the Health Secretary, of course, covered the NHS is a very uh, basic but important practical one uh, the Scottish Government, via the NHS, employs those staff. The same is not true for the social care workforce. So we are not in the same position and we don't have the same ability to uh, make the decisions that the Health Secretary announced for the, the National Health Service. But that does not mean that we are not working in other ways to address these issues uh, more broadly. Um, I've, nobody, um, uh, and I'm going to say this pretty bluntly, I bow to nobody in my admiration, respect and and deep gratitude uh, for health and care workers, the length and breadth of this country. And I, as I always have done, you know, when I was health secretary, since I've been first minister, uh, as, as far as we can within the resources we have, want to make sure that we are rewarding them uh, properly. Social care workers, and I, I'm, I'm not gonna labor this point in Scotland, and this is not to say they're paid enough at all, but in Scotland, uh, they are already paid more than counterparts in England and Wales. And we want to, as we go forward, make sure that we are valuing those who have done so much for us. But we do that in discussion and in consultation. Uh, we discuss issues of pay, reward uh, in partnership with trade unions and employers. Uh, right now, we're holding twice weekly uh, discussions with the STUC uh, and General Council members. Uh, Jamie Hepburn met with the STUC uh, on Friday. Jean Freeman is meeting with Unison, uh, I think, tomorrow. Uh, these are discussions that we take forward in the proper way, but let me be very clear that we owe a deep uh, debt of gratitude to health and care workers and it's one that uh, I am absolutely certain must be paid uh, certainly in, in words and in recognition but in more than words as well. Thank you. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Uh, on behalf of the Scottish Green Party, may I express our deep sadness at this week's news that the UK now has the largest number of COVID deaths in Europe and our thanks go to everyone respecting the lockdown. Some people do seem willing to hand away Scotland's decision making on this issue and are actively agitating for an end to the life-saving measures that are in place. But we urge the Scottish Government to continue to put public health first. 
Test, trace and isolate is now clearly stated as Scottish Government policy and I am pleased at the movement back to that approach. But like others, I want to explore the, the numbers on this. On testing, two weeks ago, the First Minister told me that she wanted to use to the full now the capacity that we are building. Uh, but she's just told us that from a, a capacity of over 10,000 yesterday, uh, over, just over 4,000 tests were completed. And that underuse of our capacity is not a single day's anomaly. The st stats published for the previous days show 1,600 or 1,400 uh, against a capacity at that time well over 8,000. It seems that since the start of this month, well over three quarters of our testing capacity has been sitting idle. So when does the First Minister believe that we will get close to using our full capacity for testing? Uh, and does she agree that this is a necessary step forward to the mass testing that Scotland needs? First Minister. Um, if I can just uh, correct Patrick Harvey's figures a, a little bit. What, what I said on Friday is by the end of this week, we will have capacity for 10,000 tests a day. We don't currently yet have 10,000. The capacity I uh, confirmed on Friday that we had reached was uh, 8,350 split between the expanded NHS lab network and the Glasgow University lab. But I also said that the change to the shift pattern in Glasgow University was uh, taking 2,000 off of that up until uh, yesterday. Uh, so the uh, testing capacity uh, up until yesterday would have been, and my arithmetic may uh, betray me a little bit here, but around 6,350. So the 4,600, if my mental arithmetic is, is correct, would be over 70% of the capacity we had yesterday uh, being used. And if I've got any of those figures wrong in the, at the moment, I will happily correct them later. I also said on Friday, and you know, this is something that uh, my understanding has been deepening over in the past weeks, there will, all, there will never be a perfect match between uh, demand and uh, capacity for tests and the use of testing because of the fluctuations in demand and some of the, the geographic uh, variations in demand. There will also never be a perfect uh, match between the number of tests we do and the number of people tested because for good clinical reasons, some people require to be tested more than once. For example, if COVID patients who are being discharged from hospital right now to go to a care home, we're requiring them to have two negative tests. So there will always be some uh, differences there, but we are, yes, uh, making working to make sure that that capacity is used to the fullest possible and practical, but also to build that capacity beyond uh, where it is now. Uh, the milestones I'd set out were 10,000 by the end of this week, 12,000 by the middle of the month, and the initial assessment for uh, where we need to go after that for TTI is at 15,500. But I would, again, inject a bit of caution over that number because uh, we may need to go beyond that. That will depend very much on how low we suppress the virus and then what the, the, the requirement will be for testing uh, to keep it at those levels. Patrick Harvey. We'll of course continue to look at the figures, but the tables published yesterday did seem to suggest 1,400 or 1,600 a day compared to a capacity of well over 8,000 uh, a day at that time. Uh, and mass testing, actual tests taking place as opposed to capacity, is only the first element indeed in TTI and it's good that the Scottish Government is placing the emphasis uh, on the work of human contact tracers uh, for the next step uh, for the contact tracing. A proximity app may well have a role to play but I agree with the First Minister that it should not and cannot replace the proven methods of people working in public health. So I was pleased to see the first estimate of the numbers needed, 2,000 contact tracers. But the, pa the plan published on Monday didn't have clear timescales attached. Uh, and even after the, the exchange with Jackson Carlo earlier, I'm still unclear uh, about what the timescale is. The First Minister says that enhanced contact tracing capacity should be in place by the end of May. Does that mean 2,000 contract tracers will be recruited, trained and deployed by then? If not, how many will be in place by then? Can the First Minister tell us who is undertaking that recruitment? Will these people be employed by public health agencies or by private outsourced contractors? And what measures will be in place to support those for whom isolation will pose particular challenges? People with family caring responsibilities, significant disabilities or complex health needs. First Minister. 
we'll set out more detail on the milestones towards the capacity and, and indeed we'll set out if, if our estimates of that capacity change uh, as we, we build towards them. But on the contact tracers, uh, health boards are already uh, looking to train uh, existing staff to be able to do contact tracing. There will be an ad uh, goes live on Friday, uh, I think through Public Health Scotland, uh, for additional recruitment of uh, contact tracers. So this work is underway. I, I would uh, ask people just uh, to try and appreciate some of the complexities and some of the, the assessments that are requiring to be made uh, to, to allow us to make uh, the, the estimates of what we need and that they will vary as we go through uh, the experience of this pandemic but we will share as much detail of that information as quickly as, as possible. Uh, briefly on, on two other points, can I just address the issue of the NHS X app uh, because again there's been understandably because these are, are technical matters some confusion here. Um, there's two different uh, types of uh, contact tracing digital product that uh, are, are being talked about here. What we're doing in Scotland is developing a digital tool that will support targeted manual contact tracing uh, led by our public health teams. There's some functionality we need that, as far as we're aware, the NHS X app will not provide, which is the ability to put in details of contacts uh, so that people who don't have the tracing app can still be contacted. And then there is the proximity app, which is the one that's been talked about. We're not developing an alternative to that. What we are trying to do is understand better how it's intended to work and how it will fit in with our systems. Here, government officials are actually uh, seeing a, a presentation of it this morning, so hopefully some of these questions will be answered. Um, I, I hope to be in a position where I can confidently say to people in Scotland, download this app because it is a useful enhancement and there are no concerns about privacy and data use, and that's what we're working towards. But it is an enhancement. I don't think we should build an entire system around it because we need to cater for people who, with the best will in the world, will not download an app of this nature because they don't have the technology or, or they won't want to uh, use technology like this. Um, and lastly, on isolation, when we talk about test, trace and isolate, we, we often focus just on test and trace. And you know, these are the areas where the government has a responsibility to ensure we have the capacity. What we tried to do at the start of this week was focus people on what isolate will mean, because this will only work if the public are willing to comply. And we will all potentially find ourselves under a policy like this being advised to isolate for 14 days, and that could happen on multiple occasions. So one of the other things we are thinking of, building and learning from the work we've done to support the shielded group in uh, this phase of the virus, is what kind of support do we have to put in place to allow people who might be homeless, who might not have the, the spare bedroom to isolate separate from their family? How do we support people? And it is about supporting people. It's not as uh, some of the more lurid headlines suggested earlier in the week, it's not about locking people up in hotels against their will, it's about supporting people to do the right thing. Because my, uh, overwhelmingly, my experience of dealing with this in the last couple of months has been the public want to do the right thing. And often what stops them is not having the ability to do it. It's not that they don't want to, so we have to provide as much support as we possibly can. Thank you. Question number four, Willie Rennie. The First Minister knows I support a universal basic income as well as a daily pay supplement of £29 for health and social care workers. I think these measures are needed now and I would appreciate an update from the First Minister if that's possible on the progress that's been made on these issues. Can I also invite her to consider our proposals for a way to protect the one in five workers on furlough? If we turn off the scheme too soon before companies can afford it, jobs will be lost, undermining its success. We propose keeping the furlough for longer, together with a taper. It helps companies get their cash flow started. In our discussions with the, with the Prime Minister, will she raise our safe return to work scheme to protect jobs? First Minister. Um, on the, the first points, I, I will you know, provide updates as and when I can. I would go back to the answer I, I gave to Richard Leonard. We, we will discuss issues of pay and reward with the trade unions employers uh, and make uh, decisions uh, on that basis. Um, on UBI, universal basic income, I uh, am on record as saying my support for that, is, well, my position on that has gone from uh, keen interest in exploring it to what I would describe now is, is active support for that, given the experience right now. We can't do that unilaterally here for reasons everybody understands, but I look forward to having Willie Rennie's support as we try to progress that idea with the UK government. Um, Willie Rennie will, will have to forgive me. I've not had the opportunity to see his proposals on the furlough scheme. I'm very, very happy to look at them in detail. Uh, as 
the latter part of his question uh, alluded to the decisions on the furlough scheme are not uh, decisions I am able to take, but I do agree in principle that we have to provide support for businesses for as long as it is needed, and we absolutely must not, uh, the UK government, uh, who are to be credited for putting in place this scheme, must not create cliff edges when they withdraw it. So I'm happy to look at the proposals Willie Rennie refers to, and if we agree with them, uh, feed these into our discussions with the UK government. Willie Rennie. I think it is important to try and work constructively on, on these matters with positive solutions. Um, many people who need non-urgent health care are in pain, discomfort and worried their conditions will get worse. For example, people with pernicious anemia suffer from tiredness, chest pain and poor balance if they not, do not receive regular vitamin B12 injections from their GP. Since the lockdown, that's not been possible. Those symptoms can become permanent if not treated. A constituent, Andrew Gould, is in severe pain with deterioration of his hip joints. He was due to have his hip replaced next week, but it's been postponed. He's not alone. We are protecting people from the virus, that's right, but they are suffering in many other ways too, as I know the First Minister knows. As GP surgeries and hospital wards are quieter than we'd feared that they would be, is the government planning a safe way for these treatments and operations to start again early. First Minister. Um, yes, we are. One of the issues we set out in the paper yesterday was uh, the, the way in which and, and, and when we can start to restore uh, non-urgent uh, elective procedures in the health service. And I know the health secretary knows uh, how uh, serious it is for people who cannot get access to, to a range of treatments right now. You know, he mentioned B12 injections. I know from the experience of somebody very close to me how important uh, that is and that can be replicated across a whole range of different conditions and, and treatments so that work to plan the restoration on a phase basis of NHS procedures that have been postponed is underway as part of our uh, general planning to come out of the restrictive lockdown as quickly as we're able to. Um, on the uh, the more general point, I would repeat uh, a very important message that for uh, people who have emergency symptoms or who have symptoms they're worried about, the health service is open for that and we need to continue to get that message across. We are seeing, uh, it's not, I wouldn't say uh, yet uh, good enough, but we are seeing signs in terms of hospital bed occupancy, for example, that that message is starting to get across and these uh, numbers are going up again, which is, is positive, uh, but we need to continue to, to make sure that that uh, message is conveyed to people. Uh, more generally, you know, dealing with the situation right now for, for anybody in a position of dealing with it is, uh, it's about balancing different harms that are being done to the population, trying to deal with the harm of the virus, but then also try to mitigate the harms of what we're doing to deal with the virus. Um, and that is the, the complexity of the decision making that all of us are grappling with right now to get back to as much normality as we can as quickly as possible in a way that mitigates uh, these different harms that are being done. And uh, I will continue to listen very carefully to what members across the chamber say about that as we will continue to listen to the views of the wider public as well. Thank you very much. Before we take some supplementaries, just to inform members that currently 31 members have requested additional questions. So, well, notwithstanding the first minister's offer, that might be um, quite a lot to get through. We've scheduled an extra 15 minutes, but we'll, we'll play it by ear and we'll see how many we get through. But that's a lot of members to get through. A lot of members. Starting with Bill Kidd, to be followed by Ruth Davidson. Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, countries including Germany, South Korea, New Zealand and Ireland have introduced tighter health and quarantining measures for people entering from abroad at airports and other points of entry. Does the First Minister think that similar measures should be being applied to people travelling to the UK? First Minister. Um, yes, I, uh, I've said this previously. I think particularly as we go into a, a suppression uh, phase again of dealing with this virus, then we, we cannot... Uh, not have uh, restrictions that deal with people coming into the country from elsewhere, whether that is uh, suggested isolation or uh, a quarantine approach. Um, you, there are arguments for, for both of these. Um, I believe this is something that is under uh, consideration by the UK government. It's a, a reserve matter, but my view is very clear that that has to be part of how we continue to keep cases of uh, the virus low when we've got it to the uh, level of suppression that we're working on right now. Ruth Davison to be followed by David Stewart. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I've been contacted by constituents who a few weeks ago received a letter from the Fertility and Reproductive Endocrinology Centre at the ERI telling them that the IVF cycle they were in the middle of was being stopped due to COVID-19. It was one letter among hundreds. It is a decision that is both completely understandable, but nonetheless devastating, as for many people, IVF is the last or only hope of starting a family. I know that the First Minister is rightly concerned about the impact that COVID restrictions might have on the mental health of the nation. And I can tell her that while IVF is a physical procedure, its mental impact can be utterly consuming. People in other parts of the UK have been given a plan which allows their clinics to apply to reopen from Monday. When can my constituents and others like them across the country expect to see a similar plan published for Scotland? First Minister. Uh, this is currently being looked at and we hope to give clarity around this uh, very soon. Um, this is, uh, as uh, has been indicated there, has been an issue across the UK and we want to get that service restarted as quickly as possible. Um, everybody who has uh, been unable to get treatment um, as a result of these restrictions is in a, a very difficult position, but I think everybody, um, and I certainly do, understand uh, the, the heartbreak and the devastation of people in this particular uh, circumstance. So uh, we will uh, make sure that as quickly as possible uh, the service uh, resumes and that we give the requisite clarity about that as soon as we're able to do so. David Stewart, followed by John Mason. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be well aware that thousands of small businesses across Scotland, from hotels to hardware stores, are trying to claim on their insurance policies because of the interruption to their trading caused by the lockdown. However, several insurers have been accused of wriggling out of their obligations, which puts the future of many businesses at risk. Will the First Minister meet with insurance companies and spell out that leadership and social responsibility are crucial during the pandemic so we can still have a functioning economy when the lockdown ends? First Minister. Um, look, I, I'm very clear, insurance companies, like everybody else who has uh, a responsibility right now, should, should play fair and should understand uh, the difficulties that businesses are having through no fault of, of their own. And I, I you know, send that message without equivocation. I think any, anybody trying to wriggle out of obligations right now is, is doing a disservice to the, the challenge that all of us are, are facing and dealing with. I'm certainly uh, happy to ask the Finance Secretary to uh, have a, a more direct discussion with the insurance sector uh, just to make sure that there is an understanding and to make sure that there is nothing further we can do in terms of guidance to uh, provide clarity about uh, what people should be doing and how they should be acting. John Mason to be followed by Jamie Halford Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the World Health Organization has warned that malaria deaths could double uh, this year because of the focus on COVID-19. And clearly that could affect some of our partner countries like Rwanda, Zambia uh, and Malawi. Can the First Minister say anything about this and if Scotland, despite the difficulties at the moment, has, can do anything to help these countries? First Minister. Well, it is uh, recognised that in countries where there's a higher prevalence of underlying health conditions, there can be added complications in relation to COVID-19. We are uh, monitoring the situation as closely as, as we can in relation to COVID-19 in our African International Development Partner countries, which, as John Mason says, are Malawi, Zambia and Rwanda. Uh, we're doing that through contact with partners and others on the ground. Uh, we're continuing to support our African partner countries through projects that are funded both under the International Development Fund and the Climate Justice Fund. At present, all projects that we uh, fund are carrying, carrying out impact assessments in relation to COVID as part of their end of year reporting and at our request considering uh, whether their existing project can assist in the COVID response in the partner country concerned. Thank you. Jamie Halker Johnson to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you. On Tuesday last week, a resident from the Glen Isla care home in my region was transferred to hospital in Aberdeen. The next day, the resident was confirmed to have COVID-19. The care home immediately took action to protect residents, but today, a week later, they're still waiting for tests to be undertaken on all residents and staff. They have been told by NHS Grampian that testing kits are not available and that there are no plans to test. Speaking on Radio Scotland this morning, the First Minister committed to looking into this case. So given the urgency of the situation, can she advise me what action she has taken since it was raised with her? Will she also look into those claims that testing kits are not available? And given the vulnerability of our care home residents and the staff who look after them, can she assure us that when there is a case confirmed in a care home, that it is government policy that all residents in Shaft should be tested as a matter of urgency to limit the potential spread of the virus? First uh, yes, that is government policy. I've made that clear. I, I said on the radio this morning that if I had the details of the care home, I would look into it. I 
to be fair to the BBC, I don't know yet whether they've provided those details. If the member wants to provide them, I will look into, uh, and the Health Secretary and I will both look into the specific case of the, the care home uh, in, in particular, but we will also investigate uh, any issues with shortage of testing kits in NHS Grampian. But let me be absolutely clear about the policy intention. Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Maureen Ward. Thank you very much. The First Minister may have seen reports in today's Press and Journal that oil and gas firms are grappling with whether to furlough workers or go straight to redundancies, which may well be open to challenge on grounds of unfair dismissal. What advice would she give to those employers? First Minister. Um, I don't want companies to make uh, workers redundant if it can in any way be avoided. So my advice to companies generally and you know, clearly I, I cannot give uh, advice here that is bespoke to individual companies in uh, different sectors, but that is my advice generally. Redundancy should be a, a last resort. Uh, the furlough scheme is there. It is not a Scottish Government scheme, although we have welcomed it and it has been very positive, uh, but we need to make sure that the future of that scheme is tailored to our ongoing uh, need to respond to the virus. And I would also therefore encourage uh, companies, whether in the oil and gas sector or, or more generally, to investigate all of the different forms of support that are available to them and to make use to the maximum, whether that's the furlough scheme or the different ranges of uh, support that are available through Scottish Government routes as well. Maureen Watt to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I ask the First Minister what engagement her government has had with the UK government regarding the commencement of trade talks with the US this week? First Minister. Uh, that is something that I think, like most other people, I was alerted to through uh, the newspapers at the weekend. Uh, the Trade Minister was advised uh, yesterday in a call that trade talks would uh, restart that afternoon. Uh, we've, he has written to the UK government seeking meaningful engagement uh, in that process to ensure that Scotland's interests are represented and protected. Uh, we've repeatedly set out that the US 25% uh, tariffs on whiskey and other Scottish goods should be removed before any negotiations start. And we must be absolutely clear that our NHS should be protected and there must be no reduction in environmental, animal welfare or food safety standards as a result of any agreement. And I think these should be preconditions for negotiations, not things that are left to the negotiations themselves. Maurice Corrie to be followed by, Ke by um, Daniel Johnson. Maurice Corrie. Presiding officer, could the First Minister confirm that outpatients who have consult consultants' appointments booked involving their test results, particularly in respect to potential cancer diagnosis, should not be postponed nor cancelled by health boards during this current emergency? First Minister. Uh, urgent treatment should not be cancelled and we've made that very clear. Um, there will be decisions made that are clinically driven about a balance of risk for different patients um, and clinicians will look at uh, the, the circumstances of a patient and uh, decide whether the risks of postponing are greater or less than the risks of a patient going to hospital potentially coming into contact with other people and being exposed to the virus. So those decisions are being made um, but where something is urgent it should be happening and not be uh, being postponed. Obviously, as I said in relation to Willie Rennie, we are now in a process of thinking through how we restore and resume procedures that are non-urgent, that have been postponed, so that we get the NHS as well as society generally back to as much normality as we can as quickly as possible. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Andy Whiteman. At University of Scotland are clear that the HE package announced by the UK government will do little to help the sector in Scotland. And while the £75 million announced by the Scottish Government to help research is welcome, it will not fill the potential billion pound plus shortfall from the income that universities would normally generate from non-EU students and private income such as venue rental and con uh, consultancy. That's almost a third of universities' income at risk. So what further measures will the Scottish Government take to ensure we do not see any universities fail as a result of COVID uh, measures? Well, our universities are facing a significant challenge and we will continue to work uh, very closely with them to make sure we're giving uh, appropriate support when and where uh, we can. Uh, the Scottish Funding Council is working closely with universities to understand their financial position and then guide any decisions that require to be taken. Um, I agree with uh, 
the member about the UK government announcement. As far as we're aware, there are no consequential uh, coming to the Scottish government through uh, that, certainly no more than, than marginally uh, the case. So the decision we have taken and announced today, I think, is an important first step and an indication of our determination to work with universities to support them through this difficult time. That's £75 million pounds for uh, research uh, funding, which has been welcomed by the sector um, and will form a, a foundation now for the discussions that we take forward with them in the months to come. Andy Whiteman to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Ministers yesterday published details of the Landlord Loan Fund, which provides for loans for landlords who are not receiving rents from tenants as a result of COVID-19. I'm not aware what consultations were undertaken with tenants and housing charities, but given that a landlord in distress is also a tenant in distress, can the First Minister explain why this scheme contains no provisions to also support tenants and why in particular it contains no prohibition against a landlord in receipt of a loan seeking to evict a tenant for arrears once the emergency legislation with its existing protections expires? First Minister. Well, I hope Andy Whiteman will recognise that given the, the nature of this crisis that we're dealing with right now, there's lots that the government is doing to support different groups uh, and individuals in society that we're not able to do the normal uh, consultation around because the time is not there to do that. We are uh, putting in place and have put in place a range of uh, supports and protections uh, for tenants, uh, whether that's through uh, discretionary housing payments or the emergency legislation uh, around protection against eviction. And actually this uh, loan fund is also uh, an indirect way to try to protect tenants. If a, if a landlord is facing repossession because they cannot pay their mortgage, then that is not going to help a, a tenant who lives in their property. Um, the loan's only available for landlords with uh, five or fewer properties, so it's not uh, available for, for big scale landlords. It's also only available for landlords who are not eligible for any other uh, government uh, support. It's a short term limited offer. And uh, we, as I say, in supporting landlords, the intention is also to support tenants. And we'll be, continue to be open to suggestions about how we can improve the support that is in place uh, and extend it where we can in future. Joan McAlpine to be followed by Mike Rumbles. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I have a young constituent, Hannah Jack, who is immune suppressed at the age of 13 and is, of course, uh, shielding uh, with her mum. Uh, her mum, Kaz, has asked me to raise the issue of safe exercise. She's very supportive of the Scottish Government's approach and the need for restrictions to uh, last as long as needed to keep us all safe. Uh, but she has said, has any consideration been given to shielded people who want to get out into the sunshine and take a bit of exercise? And is there anything that we could maybe look at, like um, restricting green spaces for certain times of the day for people who are shielded and who can't get out to exercise and get sunshine in any other way? First Minister. Uh, I'm certainly happy to look uh, in more detail at, at those very practical suggestions because I absolutely understand uh, why suggestions like that have been made and how difficult it is for, for shielded people. I mean, a lot of the decisions we're taking right now are, for obvious reasons, being guided and informed uh, by clinical and medical evidence. That, I think, is particularly true for those in the shielded group because they are being shielded because of particularly severe uh, medical conditions. Um, but we will certainly take away those suggestions in relation to the shielded group. And uh, I'll ask uh, the Health Secretary to write to Joan McAlpine when we've had an opportunity uh, to assess them. More generally, and I should stress what I'm about to say here is not specifically uh, related to the shielded group. One of the things I am very keen if we can do at early stages to allow people generally to be outdoor exercising uh, more often. Right now, the guidance says that should only be once a day. Uh, could we allow people to do that more than once a day as long as they continue to comply with social distancing? So that may well be one of the earliest uh, easing up uh, we, we make to these restrictions but of course uh, we've got to uh, also think about unintended consequences of all of these things we've got to make sure as we ease things then people still do the other things that are required to keep the virus suppressed Mike Rumbles to be followed by George Adam As they think about gradually returning to work many businesses will have real difficulty in maintaining the two metres social distancing requirement could I ask the First Minister why it is that when the World Health Organization recommends maintaining social distances of one meter across the UK, we've gone for two meters? Should our governments not be following the science as recommended by the World Health Organization? 
First Minister. Uh, the advice uh, that has been given to me, and I think it's the same across the UK, is, is two metres. Uh, Mike Rumbles is right in the sense that some countries, uh, I think, are one and a half metres. Some countries are one metre. There are other countries, as I understand it, who are two metres like us. I suppose in all of this, I have wanted to be as precautionary as possible. And I think that is the right approach. I, there is no uh, intention on my part right now to... Uh, ease that two metres or to reduce that in any way, but we continue to, to, to take advice and, and look at all of these things on an ongoing basis. One thing that is absolutely the case for all employers is that as we start to get the economy moving again and businesses coming back to work, well, firstly, as I said yesterday, it is likely to be the advice for some time that if you can work from home, you should be working from home. But as people start to go back into workplaces, there will be adaptations and redesign of workplaces required. And, and that's why we are talking to, to businesses, uh, economic or uh, business organisations, to trade unions, about how that works in practice for different uh, parts of the economy. There is of obviously a wider debate uh, sparked by the UK government's uh, draft workplace guidance, which we are consulting stakeholders on about to what extent that should be mandatory on employers with a, a, a requirement to publish risk assessments uh, versus it being more voluntary. So these are all things that we are uh, looking at in detail to get to the right approach that is about and all, everything we're doing here is about just is trying to strike a better balance than we've got just now, where we, we allow people to get back to as much normality as we can, but we don't compromise that need to suppress the virus. And none of these decisions are straightforward or absolutely black and white, but we must work through them in an orderly fashion. George Adam to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government is providing to unpaid carers during the COVID-19 pandemic? First place. Uh, unpaid carers are playing a, a vital uh, support role right now, as they always do, but particularly now to the family, uh, friends uh, and neighbours. And I know that they are feeling the pressures, as, as everybody is. Uh, we established a £500,000 fund to help local carer organisations uh, provide uh, support to carers. We also extended access to PPE for unpaid carers and are working with the national carer organisations to understand how we can better support carers to access testing. Uh, we've made emergency changes to carers' allowance and young carer grant rules to ensure that coronavirus doesn't stop carers accessing benefits support. Uh, and furthermore, as has recently been announced, uh, we will include provisions in the forthcoming coronavirus bill, uh, which has been introduced to Parliament next week, to allow for an extra coronavirus payment of £230.10 in June for carers in receipt of carers allowance uh, supplement and if Parliament passes that as I uh, hope and expect it will that will support uh, around 83,000 carers and be an additional investment directly to them of £19.2 million. Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by, by Anas Awa. Thank you. The training industry across Scotland supporting modern apprentices and learners are now hugely frustrated with the lack of confirmation from the Scottish Government as to whether they can continue to work. By following public procurement guidance for public money, training providers could receive a percentage of their contract value in advance. This would allow them to continue to support learners and develop improvements to the sustainability of modern apprenticeships for the future. Will the First Minister intervene to enable our trainers to make best use of public money because if they furlough their staff now, they are not permitted to work and provide that important support to our learners. First Minister. I don't need to intervene because I know there is work underway that Jamie Hepburn is uh, involved in to try to uh, resolve uh, these issues and get to the best outcome possible. So uh, probably the most helpful thing I can do is ask Jamie Hepburn to write directly to the member with more detail of that um, and uh, the steps that are being taken to try to resolve the issue she raises. And I saw our to be followed by Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. I broadly support the measures and the rationale behind them, but I want to raise uh, concerns about the unintended consequences. Uh, I think we are storing up uh, physical conditions and psychological trauma uh, going into the future. We already see uh, a reduction of 70% in the referral to cancer diagnosis, a reduction in uh, treatment times, uh, but also around psychological trauma. I'm aware of one constituent in Glasgow uh, whose wife is in the final stages of her cancer. He hasn't been able to see her for almost 40 days. And he, I think, rightly asked the question, why is he allowed uh, to be two metres away from strangers in supermarkets, but not able to see his wife in the final stages uh, of her life? Surely there is a practical solution to allow those situations not to happen. That could be around testing, around adequate levels of PPE and social distancing in those settings. Uh, let's not build up unintended consequences that will stay with people for the rest of their lives. 
First Minister. Um, in relation to the constituent case that Anna Sarwar raises, obviously I, I don't know all of the, the particular circumstances of that, but in general terms, uh, the, the guidance that's in place for, for hospitals or care homes does uh, allow for end-of-life visiting of relatives. So if uh, Anna Sarwar wants to pass on more details of that uh, and we can provide some clarity that might help in that situation, we are happy to do so. But we've always recognised the extreme sensitivity um, of family contact at the end of a loved one's life. On the, the broader issue, I, I hope um, Anna Sarwa will take this in the, uh, the way it's intended. I, I, I really don't need to, people to tell me about the unintended consequences of all of this. I, I spend every day, as the Health Secretary and other ministers do, worrying about thinking through, grappling with all of these issues uh, that are being created now by the action we are having to take to suppress this virus and I know everybody is and I know all of these questions come from a, a thoroughly uh, good and, and well-meaning place but that is it is both the, the the complexity of what we face but it is also the the necessity we now face to try to get to the, what is not changing over the next period is the requirement to suppress this virus what has to change is how we're doing that so that we get to a point where we've got a better balance uh, that allows people to get back to a degree of normality that mitigates these uh, unintended consequences but doesn't risk the virus running out of control. And, and that's the balance we're trying to strike. But please, uh, please be assured that we are as uh, focused on the unintended consequences of all of this as we are on suppressing the virus. And there will be a lot of support that is required in a whole range of different ways for a long time to come uh, to deal with some of what people are suffering right now. And it is very, very much at the centre of all of our thinking. Julian Martin to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, President mm -hmm. Officer. And on those unintended consequences, the, the, the First Minister has mentioned many times the very difficult decisions that have been made in judging harm potential in other health areas as we respond to COVID-19. But I'd like to hear her thinking, our current thinking, on the potential to resume our cancer screening programmes, programmes that sh she knows that they have saved so many lives before this point. First Minister. Um, again, I, I specifically made mention of this yesterday. We want to get cancer screening programmes uh, started again as quickly as possible and that is part of the work we're doing right now to look at how that can be done safely um, and in what time scale the, the i mean there's been lots of really difficult decisions in all of this and and that was undoubtedly one of the most difficult the judgment that was made guided by the chief medical officer was that pausing cancer screening would do less damage than continuing with the programs and having a situation where people miss their appointments for a variety of reasons. They had the virus, they were worried about going for a, an appointment, um, and if they missed their appointment while the programs were running, it would be three, five years before uh, their next appointment was due. Whereas if we pause it, we effectively freeze things, and when we resume those services again, everybody that was meant to get an appointment in those three months will get the appointment then. So that was the judgment that was made, but we want to get that back up and running as quickly as possible, and that's a key part of what we are working through right now. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A recent poll by BMA Scotland showed that 40% of doctors were currently living with either depression, anxiety or other mental health issues. The same survey found a quarter of those who reported a problem were not suffering prior to the coronavirus outbreak. Therefore, First Minister, what measures will the Scottish Government implement in order to monitor and improve the mental health of our doctors? First Minister. Uh, the Health Secretary will be announce, uh, announcing and outlining uh, at the end of this week, uh, probably over the weekend, uh, a package of measures uh, specifically designed to support the mental health and well-being of healthcare and uh, social care professionals. Um, we absolutely recognise, uh, you know, it's, it's a tough job at the best of times, but it has been uh, so much tougher in recent times. And there will be some healthcare professionals and, and social care staff who will have experienced and witnessed things uh, that will have had a, a profound impact on their own mental health and well-being. Um, and we take very seriously the responsibility to support them. All of us uh, in our own uh, family and friends network will be aware of, of people in those positions who are, who are suffering in that way. So uh, we will uh, make sure that members get uh, notified of the detail of the, these, uh, this package of measures uh, towards the end of the week when we're in a position to put that out into the public domain. Neil Findlay to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. First Minister, uh, my mum, like thousands of her loved one, ones, is in a care home. We now have the worst death rates in Europe, and care homes are the epicentre 
of the crisis, 59% of deaths in, uh, occurring in care homes as has been announced today. Can I therefore ask why on earth we are continuing to discharge patients from hospital to care homes without establishing whether or not they are positive for COVID-19? I am not one that ever pleads with the First Minister, but I will now. Please stop this practice now to save the lives of residents and the great people who look after them. First Minister. I'm going to come on to the specifics of what happens there because it is so important. Can I, can I say to Neil Finlay, every single one of us is deeply, um, deeply concerned and moved by what's happening in our care homes. And that is particularly the case for people like him who have relatives in care homes. But I don't think there is a single one of us who does not find this a deeply and profoundly upsetting uh, situation. So please do not uh, ask these questions in a way that suggests that we are not all trying to do everything we possibly can to do the right thing. Now, on the situation, excuse me, presiding officer, um, on the situation with care homes, um, where a, a patient in a hospital has the virus, uh, then they have to have two negative tests before they can be discharged. Where a patient has not had the virus but has been discharged to a, a care home, uh, they have to be tested um, and they should be tested uh, 48 hours before they are due for discharge. And where the judgment is that it is right for that person not to remain in hospital, but it is better for that person to be in a care home, they have to be isolated in that care home for 14 days if the test result has not uh, been known. So at every single step of the way, the priority is to prevent infection getting into a care home and the ways in which that is done is clinically driven and clinically led and it is led by the best interest of the individual and by the best interest of trying to prevent infection in care homes and I hope Neil Finlay even if he as he's absolutely entitled to do doesn't agree with the detail of that policy he will take it on good faith that we are doing the things that are advised to us as the best way of protecting individuals, whether they are in hospital, in care homes or in communities, every single step of the way. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, when we move to the next stage of this evolving crisis and look to revive our stricken economy, it is clear that some sectors are already in a more precarious position than others. Innovative manufacturing, highly skilled, productive and critical for generating income to spend in our service economy and provide taxes to pay for public services has been hard hit. What therefore can and will the Scottish Government do in cooperation with the UK Government if necessary uh, to assist our increasingly vulnerable aerospace industry, half of which is based in Ayrshire and on which thousands of well-paid jobs directly and indirectly depend? First Minister. Uh, we'll continue to work with the UK Government to support um, all sectors of the economy in um, the appropriate way. Uh, but we will also look for ways in which we can uh, give support through the Scottish Government uh, to particular sectors that are so important. The Pivotal Enterprise Fund that we announced uh, last week may be appropriate for the kind of companies that Kenny Gibson is talking about. I, uh, not that long before uh, this outbreak started, uh, visited Spirit Aero Systems in uh, Presswick, so I know how important this uh, industry is, particularly to the Ayrshire economy. So perhaps Kenny Gibson uh, could uh, look at, with some of these companies, whether that fund in particular may offer them some support. Edward Mountain to be followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, small businesses, uh, sorry, small bed and breakfasts across Scotland who pay council tax are struggling. Many cannot apply for support from the Scottish Government Hardship Fund because they don't meet the requirement of having a business bank account, which incidentally has never been a requirement of HMRC to prove a B&B business or a way to prevent fraud. Will the First Minister undertake to try and find a way of removing the business bank account requirement, which is clearly a huge stumbling block for small B&Bs applying for the grant they need? First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, the Finance Secretary tells me she is looking at that issue. What, what we're trying to do here is, is strike a balance, and that is uh, what we're doing in many uh, of these issues. And the balance we'll strike here we, would not necessarily be the same one we would strike in normal times. So that the balance is trying to make sure that there is some due process and, and good governance around applications so that we're not getting, I'm not suggesting people are fraudulently uh, applying for money and certainly not in the sector he's talking about, but we need to have some way of guarding against that without, uh, on the other hand, uh, making it 
impossible for people to access these funds. So we're trying to strike the right balance there. As I say, it's probably a, a, a less risk averse balance that we will strike now than we would in normal times. But I'll ask the Finance Secretary to correspond with the member once we've had a chance to look at in more detail at that particular issue. And Claire Baker to be followed by Willie Coffey. Um, thank you, President Officer. The £40 million Supporting Communities Fund is very welcome. While £8.4 million has already been awarded, I am aware that the location of some of the anchor organisations in Fife has then left significant gaps in other parts of the region. And I am surprised that the letter the MSPs received from the Community Secretary last week revealed that guidance on how community groups can access the fund is only now being worked on. I appreciate the reasoning be behind quickly distributing the funds, but can I have assurances that the next tranche of funding will provide support for areas and towns who have so far missed out and that the process for accessing the funds will be transparent and well publicised? First Minister. Uh, I, I'm maybe uh, helpful if I ask the Community Secretary to either speak to or correspond with the member so that we understand entirely the, the point about the, the local impact that she's making. In general terms, what I would say is yes, we will try to make sure that the arrangements that are putting in being put in place to access these funds are as uh, user-friendly and as fair as possible, and we'll learn as we go. It's a bit like the, the answer that I gave to the previous question. You know, in normal times, we, we work out all of the details of these things, uh, and then we announce the fund. We're having to do things right now the other way around. We're having to get the money uh, agreed, get the funds launched, and then we're, we're working out all of the application details as we go. It's not ideal, but we are in a, a crisis situation. That sometimes means that we will revise things as we go. There will be unintended consequences that we want to fix. There will be things that don't work properly. So what I'd say to members across the chamber more generally is, is raise these things, um, and where we can, we will act to fix them. We might not be able to fix everything, but we will certainly have a go. Um, but on the particular point that Claire Baker is raising, the community secretary is happy, will be happy to take that up in a bit more detail. And Willie Coffey. Thank you, President Officer. It's similar to the previous two questions, but could I ask the First Minister how the government can possibly support some businesses who aren't eligible for any of the current uh, financial support schemes? I'm thinking of those that are um, have an 18 k rateable value threshold that are not in retail, leisure and hospitality, those who rely on sole dividends to earn a living, self-employed who operate from home, and some businesses who are not sole op occupants of premises. All these groups are in diff difficulty at the moment and receiving no financial support as far as I know. Could we please consider what we might be able to do to help? First Minister. Uh, well we will, on an ongoing basis, look at where there are gaps and look at what we can reasonably and practically do to fill those gaps. I, I cannot stand here today and give a blanket commitment that we will be able to cater for every circumstance and fill every crack in the support that's available. But I am absolutely determined that we will do everything we can, whether that is uh, working to persuade the UK government to do more or different things, looking at adjusting the schemes they put in place to make sure they meet Scotland's particular needs, or looking, as we have done, at how we use our own powers and resources to put additional schemes in place. Um, and I think it's important that that kind of support for business continues for as long as uh, business needs it. We also continue to hear the feedback from different businesses. We've already made adjustments and uh, changed our minds on certain things as we've got that feedback, and we will continue to operate in that way. And of course, the Finance Secretary remains uh, willing, uh, she's nodding, to speak with any member about particular issues that are being raised with them about businesses in their constituency. Thank you very much. Now, I appreciate that there are still uh, nine members who haven't had the opportunity to ask a question. However, we have had a very... Uh, I appreciate the First Minister's uh, willingness to, to carry on. There is chamber business scheduled for 2.30. Hold on one second. Given the First Minister's willingness to continue, um, I, I'm going to suggest that we, uh, we start this afternoon session at, we delay it by 15 minutes, but we start at 2.45 and we'll continue for another, uh, well, until we get the nine questions through now. Thank you very much. Um, Stuart McMillan to be followed by Colin Smith. Sorry, Stuart McMillan to be followed by Colin Smith. Right. And members who are leaving, could I encourage them to be careful about observing social distancing? Uh, thank you very much, Sir. Um, the First Minister will be aware that uh, in my community, 
a wee bit three times more the level of deaths than any other part of Scotland. Uh, so what additional resources can the First Minister provide to the public sector, to the third sector and to the voluntary sector to assist with one of the most important elements that's going on locally is an issue of food provision and, and pre-prepared food provision because that's one way of actually ensuring that some of the older people and the most vulnerable people will not leave their homes to go into the community. First, uh, so I think Stuart McMillan raises an important point and I'm uh, very aware of uh, some of the concerns that have been raised uh, in and, and from Inverclyde about the, uh, the, the geographic breakdowns of, of the death that we are seeing. I, I would say every single death is a tragedy wherever it happens and obviously as this pandemic uh, develops we may see that geographic impact change in, in different ways so we, we've got to make sure that we are uh, able to respond to that appropriately. So he's right to raise the importance of support for communities as, and people as well as for businesses. Um, and we have, uh, at the very outset of this outbreak, we announced £350 million of funding to support communities where that was needed and have also committed, as part of that, a range of support in the Inverclyde area. Uh, that includes uh, funding direct to the local authority of £1.3 million for the Scottish Welfare Fund, uh, £749,000 in hardship funding, half a million pounds uh, from the food fund, as well as support to third sector and community efforts. For example, uh, grants to Oak Hill Housing Association and Inverclyde Community Development Trust. So we will continue uh, to look very carefully at the community and the human impact of all of this, as well, obviously, at the business impact. Colin Smith to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, President Officer. The, the First Minister will have received a, a joint letter signed by the General Secretaries of the Rail Workers Unions, ASLEF, TSSA and the RMT, expressing deep concern at any plan to increase the level of services on a rail network when we don't yet have government guidance on how this can be done safely, never mind have those measures implemented. So can the First Minister give a, a very clear commitment that the government and rail operators will work with the trade unions to jointly identify where there is real and necessary demand to increase services, how that demand will be met safely for passengers and workers, and make clear that there'll be no increase in services without the full agreement of the trade union. Surely that's the least we can do for our key transport workers. First Minister. Uh, in short, yes, I uh, wholeheartedly agree. Uh, my apologies, I've not personally seen that letter yet. I'm sure it is coming to me and I'll make sure I, I do uh, pay close attention to it. But those discussions with trade unions will uh, be ongoing, and if they're not ongoing already, uh, will be. Uh, on this issue, well, generally, before we can persuade workers to go back to work, we have to give them confidence that it is safe. And a key part of that is persuading those who use and those who run our public transport system that it is safe as well. If we don't do that, if we fail to do that, then no matter how strongly I might urge people to go back to work, they will not do it. Um, so that... Uh, work to make sure that it is safe to get people back is absolutely critical and central to that, absolutely um, essential to that is the, the role of trade unions uh, to represent the interests and the voice of workers and, and we are consulting uh, with trade unions and will continue to do so around the workplace guidance that the UK government has been working on. Uh, there have been concerns raised about the inadequacy of that and we want to make sure that we understand that and either through action we can take or through the discussions we have with the UK government rectify that. But let me give an assurance that the safety of uh, those who work in our public transport system and safety of those who use that system is absolutely central to everything that we will do. Thank you. Brian Whittle to be followed by Bob Doris. Brian uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I think in, in uh, following on from Stuart McMillan's uh, question, I think we all recognise the input of the third sector and the charities in supporting uh, the government's effort to tackle uh, COVID-19. But as we move forward and we, and we go towards uh, uh, coming out of lockdown, uh, we will be looking at the physical, uh, mental and emotional health and well-being uh, in our communities. And we will be leaning on the third sector uh, to help us support that. Uh, I know the First Minister would recognise that, but in talking to the, a lot of the third sector, talking to our charities and our sports clubs and our music and art and drama and our scouts and our guides, it is obvious that they are also struggling uh, and, and are t telling me that, that they might uh, have to downsize or they might not even be there at the end of this. So can I ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government are doing to ensure that at the end of this, uh, our third sector organisations are there to deliver, uh, uh, deliver for us uh, when we need them? 
First Minister. Look, the third sector is invaluable. That was the case uh, pre-COVID-19. It is absolutely the case during it and it will be the case after it. So just as important it is, as it is to uh, support businesses, just as important as it is for us to support our statutory sector, our NHS and local authorities, it's vital that we support the third sector. We've already uh, made funding available to support the third sector in the interest of time. I won't go through all of that, but we will be considering as we move forward how we ensure that those organisations and sectors who need support uh, can get that support on a sustainable basis. But let me be very clear, and this is uh, a view that's been strengthened, not created by this experience, uh, our country without uh, a strong, vibrant, dynamic third sector would uh, not be the strong, dynamic uh, country that we want it to be. So it's absolutely critical, and the community secretary uh, is absolutely determined to make sure it gets the support it needs. Bob Doris to be followed by Liam Kerr. Presiding officer, I welcome the £4.2 million additional funds from the Scottish Government made available to universities and colleges to support students during the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. However, support available may be as low as £500 for individual students that are struggling and who can no longer access summer employment in all likelihood. Will the First Minister review support for our poorest students and does she agree with me that the temporary relaxation on the qualifying criteria for universal credit to allow students to claim during the summer months, it could make a huge difference supporting students from the poorest backgrounds during these unprecedented times. First Minister. Uh, Bob Doris raises a really important issue that the emergency funds uh, made available to universities and colleges can be used to support students over the summer up to the end of July in recognition of reduced employment options. Uh, universities and colleges will receive a further instalment of higher education funds in August and it will be a matter for each university and college to determine the amount that can be awarded but the previous maximum limits have been removed. Uh, we will also continue to work very closely with the NUS and the sector regarding the support arrangements that are required in future. Um, on the universal credit point, that's uh, on whether the rules could be relaxed, that is a reserve matter, but it is one we would certainly be supportive of. Uh, but generally, we remain committed to ensuring that students are adequately supported during what is a very challenging time for them, as indeed it is for everybody. Thank you. Liam Kerr to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to the First Minister for staying on this afternoon. A significant number of offshore workers and companies have contacted me, suggesting that testing of offshore workers isn't happening sufficiently. Now, there is testing at Aberdeen Airport, but I'm told that that involves the offshore worker uh, providing their own swab, and they tell me that this doesn't feel sufficiently robust. So, can I ask the First Minister what progress has been made in protecting, with testing, North Sea oil workers, their families, and by extension the NHS, when they deploy offshore and, of course, when they come home. First Minister. Well, when workers in that category are onshore, they can use the online portal to book uh, a test at one of the drive-through centres or, or one of the mobile units, whatever is appropriate. There is also um, an increasing uh, availability, although it's still got a long way to go, of uh, test kits that can be posted out to people to use at home. Obviously, that is a a different and a greater challenge when workers are offshore and I'll certainly take away the point about how we better improve access when workers are offshore um, and the Health Secretary will come back to the member uh, in due course. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Monica Lennon. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, sorry, I don't actually expect to get called right there. Um, I've not long been contacted by a constituent uh, who with her family is shielding her, as her three-year-old son has cystic fibrosis and she's worried about what the immediate future may hold. She was keen to stress to me that outdoor exercise is key to keeping him well, very similar to the situation uh, raised recently by Joan McAlpine. Can I therefore ask the First Minister what consideration the Scottish Government have given to the impact of any changes in the framework for decision-making on those who are shielding, and how will the Scottish Government engage with those in that category about the impact on them of any future changes? Thank you. First Minister. Well, the uh, answer I gave to Joan McAlpine, uh, to some extent, will cover the response to Fulton McGregor, and we'll, I'll make sure that as we consider the, the suggestion that Joan McAlpine made, we uh, make Fulton McGregor aware of uh, our outcome to that. I, I, I want to do two things very briefly here. Firstly, is to absolutely recognise how difficult this is for people in the shielded category, particularly when that is uh, children uh, and families are having to effectively shield because of that. So we would want to do anything we possibly could to make their lives easier. 
The other thing I have to say is, is tougher, but people are, are being asked to shield for very good reasons because their health condition means that they are particularly at risk from this virus. So any changes that we would make to the, the, the advice around shielding would have to be very carefully considered and clinically advised and, and driven, which is why I want to be cautious today about raising expectations about what might be possible. But of course, we will uh, continue to look at that and take the advice of our clinical advisors. Thank you. Monica Lennon to be followed by David Torrance. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Aside from its original purpose as our emergency COVID-19 hospital, can the First Minister advise what consideration has been given to the role that NHS Louisa Jordan might play in helping to get our health service fully operational again? Has the government drawn up any criteria to assess its, or to inform its decision making? And could the Louisa Jordan be used, for example, for orthopaedic procedures? First Minister. What? This is not the most helpful answer I appreciate at the moment, but all of that is under consideration, but we haven't reached uh, final decisions. The Louisa Jordan was intended to be a hospital to deal with COVID patients. Uh, we always hoped it wouldn't be needed. We still hope it wouldn't be needed, but we can't yet rule that out uh, for uh, the remainder of, of this year. So we have to not take our eye off that principal purpose. It was always intended as well to be effectively a step down facility, not uh, where a patient would go immediately for intensive care, although it does have ICU facilities uh, to cover the eventuality of patients deteriorating. So we have to think carefully about how that hospital is configured, what that then makes it appropriate or not uh, to do in terms of the wider uh, healthcare objectives. But as we look to get a, our health service working normally again, but also to uh, tackle the backlog of certain procedures, it will be one of the things and, and the potential use of that is something that we will consider. And as we take uh, more concrete decisions around that, we will advise Parliament in the normal way. And David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister to outline what support the Scottish Government is providing to Scotland's food and drink industry as part of a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. First Minister. Uh, we're doing uh, two principal things uh, to help the food and drink industry. Uh, obviously, the virus has impacted adversely on many food businesses, particularly those dependent on exports and the hospitality trade. So we're providing uh, nearly £23 million specifically for eligible seafood businesses as uh, part of our overall package of economic support, and that includes schemes that other food businesses uh, might also be eligible for. Uh, we are also delivering cap payments to farmers and crofters uh, on time uh, as part of the published schedule for 2020. So uh, notwithstanding COVID, that schedule has continued. Uh, but secondly, we're also working with the whole uh, food industry, including retailers, to ensure that Scottish produce is getting onto shelves and to consumers to help maintain livelihoods and jobs. And uh, I want to take the opportunity today to thank everyone working in the many sectors which help to produce food and get it to our tables uh, for the absolutely crucial role they are playing during this crisis. This sector is important to Scotland's economy, but it's also really important to Scotland's brand, to our reputation and how we are seen in the world. And I want to give an assurance that we'll continue to work with it uh, to provide it with support uh, during this difficult time and as uh, we come out of this period. Thank you very much. Members will be pleased to hear that. Exhaust all our questions. Thank you all for your forbearance. Uh, I'm actually going to ask members to resume at three o'clock, not at quarter two, but at three o'clock. So we have an hour. Three o'clock in Parliament will resume. And I temporarily suspend this meeting.